Hi again, everybody. Uh, Smitty back. Um, I go by Smitty, by the way. Caroline Fari. Smitty is an old athletic nickname, so everybody calls me Smitty. Um, today, we are going to talk about injuries to the lower extremities. So we're going to start out with uh, ankle, foot, and um, a little bit on the calf, Achilles. So that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, I also have lots of taping techniques videos up for you um, on the Moodle page. Uh, those are activities that you're going to do separately from this from this lecture. So, uh, first of all, I, I I promised you I wouldn't get into a lot of anatomy, uh, and I'm not. Uh, I just want to show you just some basic structures of, of uh, the lower leg. Um, first of all, our bones of the foot. Uh, the majority of injuries when you're talking about ankle are going to be right in this region right here. Um, we get some injuries to the foot that we're going to talk about a, as well. So um, when we talk about ankle sprains, um, a few ligaments that I'm going to point out, the anterotalofibular ligament, which is this one that goes from your fibula on down to your talus. Well, that's the, the ligament that's most commonly injured uh, with lateral ankle sprains. Uh, typically comprise about 70% of all sprains are to this ligament right here. Uh, and then our calcaneofibular ligament or the one that runs from our heel bone or calcaneus up to our fibula, that's also another commonly uh, injured ligament. So um, yeah, just how complex, complicated it is. If you wanna freeze the screen and really do some study and go ahead. I still don't know all of these things, but um, for the most part, ankle ligaments are, are pretty easy because the two bones that they attach to, that's what they're named, what they go from and what they go to. So calcaneofibular ligament from the calcaneus to the fibula, et cetera. So that's a good way to, uh, to, to try to remember what they are. Uh, the joints of, of, of the lower leg, uh, the talocrural joint, the subtalar joint, and the inferior tibiofibular tibio joint, um, depending on what you're asking the, the ankle to do, um, those are the joints that control that. Um, just a, a, a little bit of uh, background for you. Um, plantar flexion is when you take your foot, maybe you hear, take your foot and you point your toe. That would be plantar flexion. Bringing your toe back would be dorsal flexion. Inversion is turning it in toward the middle of the, the body. Eversion would be turning it out toward the outside of the body. So plantar flexion, dorsal flexion, inversion, eversion are, are the motions we're, we're primarily talking about with with the ankle. Um, the arches of the foot, you have that longitudinal arch that will go across the, the long part of your foot, and then a transverse arch that'll go across the, the midline or perpendicular to the, to the length of your foot. Uh, and those arches of the foot, um, those are the primary um, shock absorbers of the foot. When you're running or pounding or jumping, uh, they absorb all of the shock. Um, we'll see a lot of plantar fascial issues um, with those with those arches, and we'll talk about those as well. And we'll show you some tape jobs on how you can can protect those arches of the foot. Um, anterior compartment. Anterior means the front of the body, so toward the front or the facial side of the body. Posterior is to the back of the body, so our anterior muscles that control our uh, the lower leg. Uh, the posterior muscles as well, and then the lateral compartment muscles or the, the muscles on the outside, your peroneal muscles that are primarily responsible for that eversion of the foot. Um, okay, you can study anatomy on your own. I'm not going to quiz you on any of that. I promise there will be no quiz questions on anatomy. Um, injuries to the lower leg. Okay, first of all, fractures. Um, Fractures can be caused by any direct trauma or direct force applied to the lower leg or any other part of the body, um, or they can also be caused by repetitive stress. So think of shin splints gone bad, right? Shin splints that we don't take care of and that tend to fester over time and time and time. We continue to pound on them. We continue to run on them or jump on them. Uh, and those micro tears become micro fractures uh, that can be very, very painful. And uh, those stress fractures uh, develop over time uh, of just that, co that constant stress or overuse. Um, stress fractures typically occur on major weight-bearing bones, uh, such as the tibia or the shin bone, um, or they can occur to areas like the foot, um, that fifth metatarsal or that, that bone on the outside of the foot, 
uh, on your pinky toe side of the foot. Uh, that is one area that is susceptible to uh, stress fractures as well. Um, stress fractures, very difficult to detect or diagnose. Uh, typically, we rely on the athlete self-reporting. Um, we think about the activity that they're doing. Uh, would that be something, that constant pounding, uh, be something that, that, that is happening? Um, and then we also kind of listen to what they're complaining of. So um, usually with stress fractures, it's characterized by a gradual onset uh, or something happening slowly and it just progressively gets worse. The pain increases over time and with, with repetition. Um, and typically it takes about four to 12 weeks for these suckers to, to, to really show themselves and, and to be really a nuisance for the athlete. Uh, the other thing that the athlete will complain of is what we call point tenderness. So point tenderness, if you took one finger and you push, if the athlete says, this is where it hurts the most, and you pushed with your finger on that spot, or you took your thumb and you pushed on that spot, and they were like screaming bloody murder, that's what point tenderness is. You push on a spot and it just electrifies them with pain. So signs and symptoms of fracture, obvious deformity. We don't have to tell you that, right? This came from your, your basic first aid class that I'm sure all of you have taken. Um, that obvious deformity, or if you see swelling, those are signs that we um, have to suspect that a fracture may be present with that bone. We may see some discoloration or, or, or bruising, uh, also called ecchymosis, um, that, that brown tint or that deep red or purple tints. Um, we may see a possible bone protrusion, we may not. Um, those would be compound fractures or, or complex fractures. If the athlete heard or felt a pop or a snap, okay, that's a great question for you to ask. Did you feel or hear a pop or a snap? That's always one of the first questions that I ask an injured athlete. Um, usually if they have a fracture, they will know it. They will have heard that or they will have felt it. Um, and then the last sign of a, a possible fracture is that the athlete can't put weight on it or doesn't want to put weight on it. Never ask the athlete to tough it out and put weight on it. We don't want to make it worse if it is a fracture. So um, if they're not comfortable or they, they think it's not right, um, then that's a positive sign. Um, the other thing uh, with a fracture, this is just a, a, a little thing that, that we do all the time. You know, when you get a cavity and you put cold on a cavity and it just really, really hurts. I know that I got a lot of cavities through my lifetime, but that's one of the same things that can happen with a fractured bone that if you have, um, if you put a bag of ice on it and it just gets a lot worse or it gives them a nauseating feeling, or it's just really, really sensitive to that ice, um, there's a really good chance that there's a fracture. Um, so just use that as a little, a, a little trick, uh, but be careful when you put ice on, you don't want them to, to have a, an adverse reaction or go into a shock. Speaking of shock, um, with fractures, no matter what part of the body, um, shock is a definite risk. Now shock, we're looking for them to become pale, cool, and clammy, right? Pale skin, they get that white ghost-like appearance. Um, their skin is kind of cool to the touch, even though they may be sweating or just finished an activity, uh, and that may be like sticky type of feeling. So watch for that. If they exhibit those, those, those shock signs, um, make sure you get them laid down as, 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 as quick, quickly as possible. Try to elevate their legs. If they have a uh, lower leg fracture, you're going to need to stabilize that when you're doing this. Uh, probably stabilize it and hold it, but just get them to, to lay back and, and get them in, a, in that position where you know, the blood flow can continue. Um, if they have any open fractures or bones protruding, we want to make sure to, um, to, to stabilize that. That middle picture is a really good picture because I love pillows for splints, for ankle, ankle issues. If you have a distal tib fib fracture or ankle fracture, um, those pillows wrapped around that area can be a really good way to splint those, those injuries because the pillow fits kind of smooth and snugly ar around the, uh, the ankle. It fills those gaps really nicely. It's soft, it's comfortable, it's not rigid. Um, so it's more comfortable for them. And then you can just take, in this case, they use duct tape, but you can take some of your athletic tape or whatever kind of tape you have and, and secure that pillow in place. That's probably my go-to for, for anything ankle related if I'm going to transport to a hospital. 
Um, types of splints, we showed you some of those on the bottom, some air splints that are just pneumatic that you just pump up. Uh, and then there's the more rigid splint, that's a posterior uh, leg splint, uh, which I really wouldn't use a whole lot. Um, they're not very comfortable. They're not walking, walking boots, they're totally different. Um, but sometimes they're, if that's all you have, it, it's better than nothing. Again, pillow, sweatshirt, something like that makes a, a pretty darn good splint. So ankle sprains. Uh, sprains, again, are injuries to the ligament or those structures that connect bone to bone. Um, ankle sprains can be caused by excessive inversion and plantar flexion. That's the, the most common type of, of ankle sprain. It is done to the lateral segment of the ankle or the outside of the ankle, usually right around that big bone that comes out the, the side of the ankle there or the malleolus, the lateral malleolus. Um, the most common ligament, like I said, that is injured is the ATF or the anterotalofibular ligament. This accounts for as many as, as much as 80 to 85% of all sprains. Um, those lateral sprains are pretty common because you think about us running and then we turn our ankle in. Um, that's a, a real common way to, to, to sprain the ligament. We grade ankle sprains in three grades. Grade one is just a mild sprain. Um, they might have some pain. They may have a little bit of motion, mo movement or laxity to it. Um, they may or may not have a little bit of swelling uh, and they probably will have some discomfort. For people who have never sprained an ankle before, that discomfort can be like the worst thing. They're like having a near-death experience. Um, just understand that, that, that they're very in tune with their body and that's something that they're not used to. Uh, and those mild sprains can be, can be pretty uncomfortable for, especially for somebody who's never had one before. Grade two sprains are a little bit more moderate. You'll see a little bit more swelling. You'll see a little bit more laxity or looseness of the ankle. Uh, the pain may increase a little bit uh, or it may not increase a little bit depending on how serious their grade one was to them perceptively. Um, and then grade threes, typically we see the grade one as, let me see if I can show this to you. Grade one, this is a normal ankle where the ligaments are nice and tight. Grade one, we may see just a little bit of movement. Grade two, we may see a little bit more separation. So as we see that separation, we have more areas within the fibers of the soft tissue for that swelling to accumulate. Uh, that's why we're seeing more swelling. And then if we have a grade three, we're seeing a more of a complete tear. Now that the, the gaps or the spacing and the fibers have opened up quite a bit, we have a lot more ecchymosis or discoloration involved. Uh, we have a lot more swelling and certainly we have a lot more laxity uh, involved with our sprain. So again, this is the area that we're primarily seeing, the lateral ankle, um, these ligaments here, the calcaneal fibular or CF and the ATF ligaments. Those are the ones we primarily see injured with, with lateral ankle sprains. If an athlete has a, a, a sprain to the medial side or the inside of their foot on the great toe side, that's a pretty significant sprain because that's not a motion that we normally take. Um, that involves typically the deltoid ligament complex, um, that type of sprain, a medial sprain, you can expect the healing time to be quite a bit longer, uh, in some cases, several weeks longer to heal for the, from those medial sprains. If we're talking about high ankle sprains, you see those a lot in, 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 in professional sports or college sports, you hear of somebody that gets a high ankle sprain. Uh, that is usually a sprain up here um, to the syndesmosis, um, where the fibula and the tibia connect. Um, there's some connective tissue there, and usually those high ankle sprains refer to, to uh, a sprain up there in that in the lower part of the leg. Okay, not doing a very good job here of displaying my PowerPoints, am I? Okay, so ankle sprains, this is what we talk about with ecchymosis. Um, this was a fresh sprain, um, a grade three or a severe ankle sprain um, that, that was incurred. Um, this coloration is about about two weeks out, I believe. Um, we're seeing the edema or swelling, a lot of swelling accumulating around the joint. Uh, and we're seeing that swelling go all the way down to the toes. And we're seeing the discoloration also go all the way down to the toes. That's just gravity, right? Um, we always talk about rest, ice, compression, elevation, or rice. Rest, get them off it. Ice, get some cold on it. We want to encourage vasoconstriction. We want those fibers to get nice and tight again, and the cold encourages that to happen. And it encourages the decrease in swelling and getting that swelling out of there. Uh, compression, 
that compression um, wrap that you put on there, that ACE wrap or that soft wrap that you put on there to compress that, that joint together, helps squeeze all of that swelling out of there and gets it working its way up through the bloodstream and getting it out of there. Um, so that's important. And then the elevation, obviously gravity, swelling's gonna fall down. So we want them to elevate their, their, their injured extremity or their injured foot uh, to get that swelling out of there. The ecchymosis, we're seeing that as well. Uh, it, it travels with the swelling. So we're, that's why the, the, the toes are not injured here. We're just seeing that gravity take all the dis discoloration and that blood uh, that, that, that seeped out with the injury. It's, it's traveling downward. Um, interestingly enough with this, you know, when we see bright, bright red, that is fresh blood that's still accumulating in the area. When it gets into purple, that's old blood, right? It's, it's dried out blood. The first 72 hours are the most critical for, for sprains for you to, get, to provide that compression wrap and to provide that ice and elevation. In that first 72 hours is when the, the, the injury wants to bleed out the most. If we can keep swelling out of the joint, then they're gonna heal faster, okay? Anytime that swelling is there, that's gonna restrict mobility. Um, and it's, if they're not like able to move it, then they can't get fresh blood flow to the area. Um, it, it's just going to mess things up. So we want to get that rest, ice compression, elevation, and that is especially important in the first 72 hours. Um, I always get the question, what about heat, Smitty? Should we put heat on it? No, do not put heat on it, especially in the first 72 hours. That's going to encourage more vasodilation, which is going to encourage more blood to seep out. And if it's already injured and it hasn't stopped bleeding, then we're going to feel that joint uh, with even more swelling and even more blood. We don't want that to happen. So rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, the only time I really use heat is when I'm re-educating that athlete to return to physical activity, or I'm getting them ready for some, some rehabilitation things after the acute phase of the injury. Um, and then I'll, I'll use heat to, to kind of loosen up the, the muscles or the fibers just to, to get it ready for movement. Always cold after. So grade one sprains, grade two and grade three, we talked about those based on, on the pain scale, um, how much disability, how much um, function that they've lost, how much point tenderness that they have. Grade one, again, mild, grade three is severe. Talked about right rest, ice, compression, elevation. We can throw a P on the front and that is protection. We wanna put them on splint and crutches if we need to, or a brace, or we may want to tape them if we're getting them back into activity. Um, so some type of, of protection, uh, again, uh, with a, with a basic mild ankle sprain, um, I'll try to get them to avoid crutches if I can. I don't want them to, to favor it if we don't need to. Again, if it's a near death experience, I'll, I'll let them stay on the, with the crutches for a, a day or two. Uh, but then as long as it's not broken, as long as the x-rays are clear and we know it's just ligament and it's stable enough, it's not a grade two or a grade three where we've lost a lot of function. Um, I'll, I'll want them to get off those crutches. Grade two or grade three, um, yeah, I, I want them to use crutches. I don't want them to fall down and injure something worse or potentially uh, have a fracture. When you're applying that compression wrap, I, I've put a video on Moodle for you to, to show you how to apply a compression wrap. Uh, keep in mind, we wanna use soft elastic tape for that, not a regular white athletic tape. We want that that, that muscle, uh, we want it to be comfortable for one, but we also want um, some mobility uh, so that they can do some exercises with that, that, that motion. We're not trying to completely immobilize it. When you put that compression wrap on, we like there to be a horseshoe underneath. Um, you can usually use a, a piece of felt um, or a piece of foam, make that horseshoe, make sure the handles are facing up, go right around the outside uh, of the lateral malleolus here, so you're facing around. And what this will do is it'll help squeeze or, or take away those pockets where the swelling likes to accumulate. Uh, and when you put the compression wrap over the top of this from mid calf down all the way down to the toes, it'll, this little horseshoe will squeeze that swelling and won't let it accumulate around that malleolus. Uh, and that will help them restore function a whole lot quicker. Um, if you take this off in a couple of days, you'll notice a huge indentation uh, and that's when you just want to celebrate because that's all swelling that you prevented from getting in that area and restricting the mobility of that joint. So, so use horseshoes if you can. Again, foam or felt works best. 
Other common injuries that we're going to talk about, we'll go through these one by one. Um, just looking at the Achilles tendon first, you, you have your gastroc that comes down in, into your calf, your calf muscle here, those, those two egg-shaped uh, muscles in the back of your calf, uh, and they fuse into your Achilles tendon. Uh, right above your heel um, in, is that soft, spongy part of the Achilles, and that's the area that is most often injured uh, either with Achilles tendonitis or an inflammation of the Achilles tendon uh, or ruptures uh, are, are right in that area as well. We'll talk about each separately. Um, compartment syndromes, uh, actually I should go back to Achilles tendonitis. Um, tendonitis is that inflammation. So if you're running, maybe you have a, a, a shoe with a pretty good heel lift uh, and that's keeping your foot uh, raised up a little bit, or if you have a lot of dorsiflexion or your heel comes all the way down on the ground and you keep pounding, that stretches that Achilles out quite a bit in that sensitive area, and that can lead to inflammation of that area. Uh, runners, distance runners in particular, or people that are running like soccer players on grass or, or spongy environment are more susceptible to developing Achilles tendonitis. Uh, important takeaway there is make sure that you're having your athletes uh, put ice on their on their the back of their Achilles after activity. If you have shoes, to make sure that the, the 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 back of the shoe is not rubbing in that area. That can also lead to some inflammation. And basically, what that inflammation is is a little collection of fluid um, in that area that likes to sit and fester, um, and it can just aggravate the tendon. Achilles ruptures are very, very different than that. Achilles ruptures are, are caused by a sudden start or a sudden stop with a change of direction sometimes. Maybe you get somebody backpedaling that's in that dorsiflected position where their, 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 their foot is back and their, their, their heel is down and they're stretching their calf all the way out uh, and they're backpedaling or they're changing directions. That's when we, we see Achilles ruptures. Um, typically they will complain of hearing or feeling a pop People will around them will have heard or felt or, or not fail, but they will have heard the pop. Um, it stops the person in their tracks. They cannot move. Um, that's a, a very serious injury that that usually requires surgery. So that's a big deal. Um, so just kind of watch for those things. Um, I know this is a gross slide, sorry, um, but um, acute compartment syndrome is the result of two different things. We can have a chronic compartment syndrome and an acute uh, compartment syndrome. This is why soccer players wear shin guards, okay? And football players should protect their shins. When you take a shot to that anterior part of your shin or that front of your shin, that bone takes up so much of the space in the shin that there's very little place for, for swelling to accumulate. So the tissue that you have in the front of your shin is there, it is injured by that hit, and you have swelling that needs somewhere to go. And it's basically being choked out by that bone. So what can happen is that swelling compresses the nerve or compresses the arterial supply to the foot. When this happens, what you wanna ask your athlete is to, or instruct your athlete, is to watch for signs of their foot falling asleep and they can't wake it up right? They can massage their foot or they can pump their foot and they can't get their foot to wake up. This is a potentially life-threatening situation because that nerve supply or that arterial supply is being choked. So it's rare. I don't want to scare you. It's rare. But when it happens, it's a big deal. It's a really, really big deal. So um, if you're involved in a sport that there's a risk of, of taking a shot to the shin, make sure your, your athlete's shins are protected with shin guards or padding. Um, and then if they do get a hit and they're not padded, or even if they are and they, they, it just hurts on the anterior shin, make sure you get ice on that right away. This is not something that we wanna put a compression wrap on that only encourages that, the restriction, um, but we do wanna get ice on it. We do wanna elevate and we do wanna rest. Okay, um, the pictures here that are the girls pictures, this is the result of, of a compartment syndrome gone bad. Um, if that pressure builds up, that, 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 that pressure just wants to go somewhere and it can't, what they end up having to do is you have to get that athlete to the ER. They'll be in the operating room very quickly and they basically just fillet them open um, to uh, release that pressure and to let that go. Um, compartment syndrome can also occur, I'll get off that slide. Compartment syndrome can also occur with shin splints 
um, in a more chronic way when shin splints continue to fester and the, the inflammation continues to increase, um, that can also cause a compartment syndrome and, and result in surgery. So um, just be aware of that, not trying to scare you, but kind of trying to scare you to know that that's, a, that's kind of a big deal um, if that foot falls asleep and you can't wake it up. Okay, shin splints, all these are, are just an inflammation of that tissue in the front of the shin. Um, it can be caused by a number of different factors, right? Your, your athlete's not being properly warmed up. Um, your athlete's not being ready for the activity that they're, they're going to do. They're not being properly conditioned for the activity. Um, bad shoes, right? We have all these minimalist shoes nowadays that drop our feet and lower our arch on our foot. They don't give us proper uh, support on the bottom of our foot. And that actually transfers that pressure, transfers that stress up the shin. So um, just watch for this. You know what they are. I don't have to explain what shin splints are. The tenderness on the shins, the pain on the shins. Uh, constant aching. Um, we need to get on top of these. One, we want to prevent them, but in many cases, they're going to happen. So when they happen, we need to take appropriate care. Um, if they're pretty significant, we need to get the athlete off of their 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 stress. Right? We need to stop, have them stop running, stop pounding, uh, and get those things taken care of with lots of ice and therapy. Um, there are no tape jobs that can prevent shin splint. There are no tape jobs that are going to magically cure shin splints. There are some compression wraps like the one shown in the picture that can help with just keeping the shins warm so they're less likely to get shin splints, um, especially on cold days. Uh, we can use some heat packs and, 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 and heat our shins as well and just proper straight stretching and strengthening. Um, one thing I, I just want to encourage is if you have an athlete with heavy shin splints, like a runner, and you're worried about them losing conditioning, put them on an exercise bike, have them do some good interval training on that bike. Uh, and I can pretty much guarantee they're not gonna lose their speed uh, running if, if they're on there for just a week or two. So um, those are our ways to, to deal with shin splints. Um, also, there are two tape jobs that I'm showing you um, on our Moodle page. There is a low die and an arch tape job that you might wanna try. Um, they're not cures for shin splints, but what it can do is it can change the, the dynamics of the, the tension that's on the muscles on the bottom of the foot so that if we kind of release some of that tension, all of those muscles that come up from the shin are inserting down on the bottom of the foot. So if we can release that tension on the insertion point at the foot, we can relieve some of that tension being felt up top. And that can, can kind of create some relief uh, for ath some athletes that are experiencing shin splints. Highly recommend the low die tape job. I, I think it feels fantastic and I've had great success with it with my athletes. Um, but again, it's not a cure. We still want to do the, the, the icing and, and, and take appropriate care for them with some strengthening and some stretching exercises as well. So just different things on the foot with arch pain or plantar fasciitis, any pain that, uh, it, is on the bottom of the foot in that soft tissue of the foot, we refer to as plantar fasciitis. Um, we can look at the way somebody's arches are. Some of us have flat feet, some of us have really high arches. Um, the shoes that we buy are so important. Um, it's important that we buy the right kind of shoes that, that match our, our needs biomechanically, that match our gait or, or the way we, we strike uh, our foot to the ground. Um, so it, it's also important that we change shoes regularly, that we're not wearing shoes for a thousand miles, or that we're not taking our old running shoes that are giving us minimal support for running and we turn them into our day-to-day -day wear shoes. Um, it's important that we tie our shoes, that our foot's not sliding around in our, in our shoe. So all of these things are recommendations you can make to the athlete. Hopefully you have a, somebody in your area that is at a shoe store or a running store uh, that can help analyze that gait and help look at um, how the foot is striking and make recommendations for the appropriate type of athletic shoe. When in doubt, when we have um, plantar fascia pain, one of the things that I like to uh, encourage my athletes to do is to not wear a soft, spongy shoe during the day. Um, I'll ask them to wear like a nice boot or a hard, rigid shoe during the day. Um, church shoes, something like that walking boot or a, a hiking boot that doesn't have a lot of bend in the, in the toe, um, that can help stabilize the foot or splint the foot during the day. 
Uh, and then when they go to practice, then they put their athletic shoes on. And, and that's just one little trick that we use uh, in our athletic training room. So different things that, that can be causes of, of plantar fasciitis, uh, poor running technique. All of you track coaches and cross country coaches are laughing right now because you know this. Um, poor running techniques, poor footwear, uh, running on uneven surfaces, running on hills, running on spongy grass surfaces, changing the type of surface that we run on. All of these things can, can lead to um, plantar fascia pain. Signs and symptoms, they have pain in the bottom of the foot. They have pain when they bend their foot. They have pain when they're, when they're walking, when they, when they spring off of their foot, that last part of the step when they're coming off of their toe and trying to lead off of their toe, they can have pain. They may have heel pain. Um, the heel is the most common site and location for plantar fascia pain. Uh, almost 50, a little bit more than 50% of all plantar fascia uh, problems are related to the heel. Uh, again, footwear or not having a, a, a pri the appropriate type of, of heel support. And there's also a tape job for you online um, for you to tape the heel. Um, a nice, easy tape job that is another one that's just absolutely wonderful, feels fantastic. Okay, um, I've lost my, I gotta come off of my thing because I'm, I'm losing my, um, my, my captions are showing above my title. So this is metatarsal fractures. Um, these are fractures to the midfoot. Um, we have lots of different fractures that we get. Um, again, if they hurt or felt a pop, that's a, an obvious sign that we need to send them in and get an x-ray. Um, the fifth metatarsal or a Jones fracture is a very common site for a fracture. That's on the outside of the foot, uh, just below the pinky or above the pinky, I guess. Um, typically, fractures of the foot generally require about six to eight weeks of non-weight bearing activity. So uh, they're typically be on crutches or in a walking boot um, as they graduate through the sequence. Um, and this is something that usually they don't do surgery on, but sometimes they need to if they have to uh, apply a pin, depending on the degree of the fracture. Okay, this is just an x-ray to, to show you a, a possible fracture. Um, Okay, other types of metatarsal stress fractures. Uh, the second metatarsal or the, 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 the toe right next to your great toe, your big toe, um, these, these are called march fractures, uh, changes in running patterns or doing my, a lot of miles or running heels can, can predispose an athlete to, to these types of injuries. Um, often associated with a Morton's toe. What a Morton's toe is, is if their second toe is longer than their great toe, um, that is a Morton's toe. Um, nothing wrong with that. I have a Morton's toe. Um, it just predisposes them. It just puts an additional stress on that second metatarsal uh, because typically that, that, that toe gets into greater flexion. Uh, signs and symptoms, again, pain and tenderness along that second metatarsal. They may have pain with running and walking. Um, and um, we want to have them do uh, non-weight bearing activities again. Um, heel contusions, um, they have severe pain in the heels. Um, again, a, a form of plantar fasciitis. This is so easily fixed. One thing I would like to recommend to you is that you not go to like your local pharmacy and get one of those heel inserts. Uh, those are not anatomically perfect for everybody. I think the best way to do it is just to, to apply the, the heel tape job that I've showed you on Moodle. Um, and um, that's more anatomically correct. And, and basically all it does is it takes that, that tissue on the back bottom of the heel and it even puts even force on that tissue to alleviate some of the tension uh, being experienced in some areas of the tissue. Um, reduced weight bearing activity for 24 hours. Really, we just wanna ice it uh, really good, uh, get it to kind of settle down and then apply that tape job to, to get them going. And then they put their shoe right over the top of the tape job. Have them try that and, and, and see how they're feeling. Here's some other, uh, another graphic here just showing where uh, potential areas for, for spurs or bone spurs that can develop along the ankle. So many joints, all of these little red marks down here show where bone spurs can develop. Um, this is important because if we allow swelling to stay in the joint, um, that swelling can harden and can actually affix or adhere onto the bone. And that is not good because then it can restrict that joints ability to function properly. It can cause pain for one, and it can just restrict mobility. So 
Again, a, another advertisement for the importance of icing and, and not having swelling accumulate um, in the joint. So a pump bump, um, this is that little exostosis or that, that formation on the back of the heel uh, that can develop. It is not any big deal unless it affects the, the, the tracking of the Achilles tendon. So we really don't have to worry about these types of things. Um, we can develop exostoses um, from our shoes rubbing on the back of the heels. Um, we can develop them from um, other types of pressure or, or um, forces being applied, consistent force or consistent friction being applied to the back of the heel. Again, usually it's not any big deal, but if the athlete starts experiencing um, additional swelling with it, if it's very tender to the touch for them, um, that wearing a shoe bothers them, that it's, it's just um, getting to be the point where it, it produces pain or discomfort, uh, then you definitely wanna send them in for that. Um, also, um, just be aware that, that it can, like I said, affect the Achilles tendon. Um, so yeah, again, importance of ice and getting rid of those things, um, not letting them develop in the first place. Uh, a lot of us have heard of turf toes. Um, turf toes are big deals, right? Uh, those of you who have played football know this. Um, a turf toe is, a, is an extension or hyperextension of the great toe right at the joint line where the toe meets the foot. Any type of extension of that toe hurts. So if they're walking, it hurts because that, that tendon on the bottom is getting stretched. And every time it gets stretched, it just sends those symptoms. Um, it is typically accompanied by pretty significant pain. Uh, it can be accompanied by swelling. Um, and what we need to do again is get them off it. Um, we'll hear of big, tough NFL players getting uh, turf toe and being out for six to eight weeks. Uh, it's a no joke injury. So just understand that that dorsiflexion will be affected. It's a type of plantar fasciitis. Um, again, we want to encourage them to wear a nice rigid shoe uh, that doesn't allow those toes to flex or doesn't allow any movement up. Uh, and then when we get them back into activity, there's actually a tape job that, that, that we can do to, to try to keep that toe straight. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to show you that tape job. It's a little bit more complex, but uh, you guys can find my email and uh, email me and I can send you a video and, and show you how to do that if you want to. But it's a little bit more of a complex tape job and, and certainly something more advanced. Okay, moving on. Okay, just different uh, calluses and, and blisters. Uh, important thing on blister, um, we got to watch for those signs of redness around the blister. Watch that redness. If it increases, then that's something that we need to get the athlete into uh, a physician to get some antibiotics because that's a sign that infection is, is developing. Also, if you see any streaking that, that goes up or down from the, the area of, of the injury, that's another bad sign uh, that uh, antibiotics need to be on board. And that's something a physician needs to, to prescribe specific to, the, to that condition. Um, another thing about blisters, don't take a needle and pop it. Okay, don't remove the skin from the outside. That skin is giving a nice protective barrier. We want that skin there. Uh, and that needle, if you put a needle in there to drain that blister, uh, you better make sure that needle is sterile, first of all, because that's giving it an automatic um, access to the entire bloodstream for the entire human body. So we don't wanna use non-sterile things. And, and, and typically um, we just don't pop blisters. That's, that's, that's something that we need to have somebody else do. Legally, I have to tell you that, that you can't drain a blister. Um, calluses are just uh, a type of just dead skin. It's gross, right? Uh, dead skin that collects in the area. Um, you can do what my grandma always used to say it, for, for those kind of things. My mom had really nasty feet and the whole thing was, okay, soak it in the hottest water you can have that you can tolerate, the hottest water you can tolerate and put some Epsom salt in it and soak it and all of that dead skin will kind of work its way, break, break up and then you can kind of start picking at it and using a big file and, and filing that stuff off. So it's not gonna hurt anything. It can be discomfortable, um, uncomfortable. It can be, um, it can affect gait patterns if it gets to be as bad as these two things are. Um, and it's certainly really ugly, but um, yeah, not, a, not a, a real critical thing and probably something you won't see a whole lot of in your sports setting with high school kids. Okay, um, here's another type of exostosis that, that can uh, occur on the first metatarsal. Um, you get these types of bunions and, and 
and things, oops, get these things uh, develop. I'm gonna take it out of slideshow view for just a minute. Um, just looking at this, um, these develop on the inside of the great toe. Um, usually they're not a, a, a huge deal unless the great toe starts to rotate, um, then they're, they become a big deal because that can affect walking patterns and gait and, and can, can start to be problems down the line for, for uh, functionality of the joint. So just watch for that malalignment. Um, typically, um, we just want to, um, again, it's caused by swelling that just wants to accumulate that in that area and we haven't taken really good care of it so it just kind of starts to adhese in that in that little section of skin there so prevent it from happening in the first place and if it does happen um start getting rid of it right start doing those those, those ice treatments um and and just be a, 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 uh, advised that you have the little bursa sacs what bursa sacs are they're tiny fluid filled sacs we have them all throughout our our body and in, in joints We'll talk about them a lot when we get to the knee joint, uh, but those bursa sacs can get punctured. The friction from a shoe can get it or a force can get it and can pop those bursa sacs and that can um, expel a lot of fluid out into that, that, that specific area around the bursa. So um, if that happens, if the bursa becomes in flames or it gets punctured, um, that can cause that fluid to, to sag out there too. Again, tenderness, swelling, enlargement of the joint. Um, we wanna wear correct fitting shoes, something not with a super tight toe box um, and, but not something with a super wide toe box either where the foot can just kind of rotate around. We want a nice, well-fitting shoe. Um, and then, um, just kind of watch for that. And if the toe does start to rotate that, that would be the only time or, or if the, the, the exostosis was really big, um, that'd be the only time that the, that the surgeon would really need to go in. Morton's neuroma. Uh, so you have nerves, uh, they innervate your, your toes and supply the, the, the feeling in your toes. What Morton's neuromas are, are um, usually it happens between uh, the second and third toe, but it can also happen between the third and fourth toe or even the, the fourth and fifth toe. Basically, the, the bones get squeezed in there and it irritates the nerve. It rubs on the nerve and it irritates that nerve and causes that nerve to bulge. Um, if you have a really tight toe box in your running shoe, for example, um, that's um, something that can happen because those those those. Um, metatarsals get really together and just start rubbing and, and get squeezed together. Um, cyclists, this is a, a common thing with cycling shoes because those cycling shoes are so small and the toe boxes are so tiny. Um, that's another um, type of athlete that are predisposed to this. So if you get these, these neuromas, um, it's a pretty simple fix. We want to apply a, like a felt a teardrop, cut it in the shape of a teardrop, a small teardrop, place it underneath the bottom of the foot to try to separate those bones on the bottom of the foot. Um, just try to give it a gapping, uh, create a dam so that those bones can't rub together. Uh, and then just put a nice little pressure wrap around that. Hopefully that, 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 that little teardrop, that foam or felt teardrop on the bottom part of the foot underneath those bones will, will help reduce that pressure. Um, and if not, then they're gonna need to go in um, and uh, be seen. The, the signs and symptoms of this, um, they will experience uh, sharp, pain kind of feels like a knife jabbing them in, in the top of the foot or in between the toes, um, right at the junction of the, the toes and the foot. Um, sometimes their foot may fall asleep or, or that area of the foot may fall asleep. And then when it wakes up, then they get that intense pain. So those are kind of the, the signs and symptoms that you'll look for there. So that's the slide that corresponds to the information I just gave you. Metatarsal heads, the paresthesia, severe intermittent pain in the forefoot. And the, po the, the pain is typically relieved when they massage their foot or if they get off it. So again, check the shoes, make sure that the toe box is not super, super tight. That's the first step. Second step, try that foam or felt teardrop underneath there. Um, you can Google that and, and find out how to do that. Uh, and then if that doesn't work, then get them into a, to a doctor. Or if the pain is pretty significant, get them in. Okay. So bungal hematomas, uh, what these are, um, are just uh, blood that accumulates underneath a nail bed. Um, you know, if you slam your finger in the door, you get a subungal hematoma in your, in your finger. Um, they're not a huge deal. They can be very, very painful. Uh, for those of you that have experienced this, you know. Um, we wanna get some ice on it to try to reduce some of that swelling. Uh, but just like uh, before, 
that nail doesn't really expand and there's not a lot of area for that swelling to go. So that pressure will build up. Um, and sometimes if the pressure is, is intense enough, they need to get into a, a doctor and what they'll do is they'll lance it. They'll, they'll put a sterile needle right through the top of the nail bed uh, to release that, that, that pressure, just uh, drains that pressure out. Uh, if not, uh, if they can uh, stomach it, they'll, they'll just deal with it for a few days and, uh, and then the, the pressure will go away after probably about 24 hours. Uh, and then um, they end up with um, the toe that looks like purple toes. Um, we see this a lot with distance runners, people that, that you know, cross country runners, that, that second toe, especially if they have a Morton's toe, like, like these feet, uh, the second toe is longer. Um, they'll get that blood accumulating underneath the second toe, um, the pressure build up, and then eventually that pressure isn't there anymore and they just have an ugly purple toe. Um, and then depending on the severity of it in anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, that toe will fall off. So yeah, there you go. So that is it for the lower leg. Um, we're going to get on to the knee next.